We're very happy and excited tonight to be joined by two extraordinary actresses. Mercedes Rule is currently appearing on Broadway in Edward Albee's The Goat, giving an absolutely fantastic, thrilling performance. She appeared last year in a revival of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf at the Guthrie Theater. She is also, of course, well known for her movie roles, including The Fisher King, for which she won an Oscar. And I'm very happy to have Mercedes Rule here at Theater Talk. Thank you. Welcome. And our wonderful uh, dear friend, Marion Seldes, who's back with us, uh, who is now appearing not in an Edward Albee play, but a play called Helen at the Public Theater, but who has a lot of experience with Edward Albee's work. She was in Tiny Alice on Broadway and A Delicate Balance and was absolutely brilliant in Three Tall Women a few seasons back. Marion, welcome back to Theater Talk. Thank you. Um, all right, um, Mercedes, let's tackle The Goat first, which is one of the, um, I think, most controversial plays to come to Broadway in a long, long time. Uh, it's a play, of course, about a man, your husband, who falls in love with a goat. How is the Broadway audience responding and reacting to this difficult and demanding and exciting work? Well, <clears throat> we as a nation, we as Americans, are a fairly literal group. Um, we like to take our art straight up, literally, you know. So it's very hard. A piece that asks the audience to enter into the reality of the play through a metaphor. Now, I know Edward doesn't talk about metaphors. He's the writer. It's not his job. to. to those are critics' terms. But, um, that, that becomes a little bit more difficult for an American audience. The goat stands in for many things. Yes, it is a play about a man who falls in love with a goat. And that, that relationship, which happens to become a spiritual, numinous relationship, um, the news of this relationship has to be brought back to his family, his society. And the question is, what do they do with it? What does he do with it? I don't think that, that Edward actually judges the situation. He says, this happens. Right. And it is complicated by the fact that the man had an experience of the eternal, mm -hmm. an epiphany over here. Mm -hmm. This, the applications are numerous. Now, to get back to the audience, there are those who see this a, as a play about bestiality. And what's very interesting is if you stop there, you don't take the incredible journey that the play is about. Right. But people have really, I mean, really some extraordinary critics, intelligent, first-class minds, have stopped with the bestiality issue. And I've wondered, apparently it's not an intellectual leap you have to make. Mm -hmm. It's uh, more of, a, of a, 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 a psychological or a spiritual leap you have to make if you want to go beyond the bestiality in the play. Mm -hmm. So the audience is a spectrum of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, every kind of response, every willingness, Every level on on the spiritual scale of willingness is you're out getting, there. You're getting devastation at the end of the play by some people, crying some nights, anger, anger is always a part of the mix. Very nervous laughter, rage, not uh, not wanting to be mind bleeped mm -hmm. again by right. uh, another clever playwright. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, but you're not gonna. Now, play how with do you mind. find out about the anger? How does how does an actress on know stage about the feel anger. the yes. anger? Oh, that's interesting. You, you know there. everything. You, you know, know everything. the audience tells you, you yeah. or zens you <clears throat> everything. You know if they're happy, and you certainly know if they're fascinated. So you know if they're angry or re revolted. Yeah. Or, or and withholding. And occasionally in a play, not a nod of Edwards, you 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 have something to say that is disgusting, and you disgust them. Mm. You see, but we're so used to being pleasured by television and films and life, if possible, <laughs> that when these moments come, and in Edward's plays, they come often. Mm -hmm. He's relentless. He's relentless with his comedy, too. Mm -hmm. He keeps, uh, it's so strong in, in Edward's writing. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Take so if you are uh, an actress uh, playing any of his plays, you have to, well, I think, and Mercedes will say, you have to be so strong in your belief of what you are doing and saying that whether they come with you or not, you still go. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you, you don't need to seduce them. You don't need to encourage that love. That's not what Edward is in the theater for. He is there to disturb them. And they're going to resist that. I mean, I, I, sometimes I think people are intimidated by these plays. If you are going to 
a complex, non-literal, uh, to get back to my original right. point, place. Mm -hmm. You're going to bring the audience on a difficult journey. If you're going to bring them on a difficult journey, then yes, they will resist. We do resist the difficult, um, especially if it's going to bring us someplace that's going to disturb us and leave us um, uh, jolted, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so in this play particularly, it's very funny. It's humor. It's the very uh, humor that surrounds the idea of the goat that slides you into home base. Right. And home base winds up being, it's like a Thurber cartoon that brings you all the way to a Greek tragedy. Well, interesting you, you say that because Edward has said one of the big influences in his life was James Thurber, with whom he there was quite have. friendly, and he and he uh, read all of Thurber's work and spent a lot of time with him. And I think you're absolutely right about that. I mean, there's a lot of in the play about the baby that you were in last season. There was a lot of James Thurber's type humor in that play. That was a disturbing play too, where another play where the audience is laughing one minute and the next minute they don't know how to take some of the things that are going on in that yes, play. Yes, and <laughs> also they discuss it a great deal afterwards. But when I first read The Goat, what? Sort of, I was going to use the word destroyed. What did it, and thrilled me was that it seemed to me it was Edward's Greek tragedy. I mean, if you studied the Greeks, I thought they were the, the only playwrights I would play when I began to be an actress. I thought, well, I'll do all the Greek plays. It <laughs> never <laughs> occurred to me there was no audience for that, <laughs> but that's all right. <laughs> but when I read this play, I. I didn't question one moment of it, and at the end of the play, when the tragic moment happens, uh, the, the terrifying thing that happens, I accepted it the way you would accept Iphigenia being yes. slaughtered on an altar. It's a, it's a classic play. There's an, inevitabil an inevitability exactly. to what has to happen in exactly. this play. And these actors and this actress, uh, back to what I sort of grumbled before with my throat trouble, um, are, are, they are so passionate, mm -hmm. even in the comic moments, even when Mercedes and Bill Pullman do that almost to take off on Noel Coward, mm -hmm. who's another playwright Edward loved. Uh, it's, it's with a kind of utter conviction, mm -hmm. and without that you don't have the play, which brings us back to Edward's idea of what actors and actresses can do. Mm -hmm. If you look at that list of people which he now calls his family, if you go back to Uta Hagen in, mm -hmm. in uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, a part which Mercedes has only recently played, and, and you include the great Irene Wirth, and uh, oh, so many. Rosemary so many. Harris, oh, and Elaine Stritch. Exactly. <clears throat> I mean, and, and the men too, but we are talking about the women's parts. Um, in every case, they have just taken the play and run right, with it. Right. There's no, there's no holding back. You can't hold back. No, you, it's uh, the only way you're going to approach an Ed role before. He's mm -hmm. both intellectual, among the most intellectual of our writers, if not in some ways the most intellectual writers of American writers currently writing, and also the grandfather of them all. But still, at the moment, mm -hmm. you know. But he also is visceral. Yeah. He catches you here, it gets you in the heart, and to do the heart, and the to have that, be that passionate, but also that um, precise and delightful verbally and emotionally is a rare combination. But I just wanted to add this about the laughter. At that tragic moment, sometimes there is oh, a volley yes. of laughter. Oh, sometimes yeah. <clears throat> there is a, there's a gasp. Yes. Sometimes there's utter silence. And y you get the whole spectrum of that, too. Mm -hmm. And I was watching a television show about comedy. Um, uh, just a couple of nights ago, uh, it had been a tribute to a great comedian and several comedians were speaking afterwards and they were talking about comedy and about the um, appropriateness of laughter. Mm -hmm. And this, this comic said, oh, you cannot have inappropriate laughter in a sense. It's like having an inappropriate cough. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, that's true. Something yeah. true, yeah. something right. visceral has just out. been hit yeah. and happened and it comes out. Yeah. Right. So the laughter, in a sense, is never inappropriate in the play. Mm -hmm. And this a comic, and I, I didn't recognize who he, uh, who he was, so if he ever watches this, forgive me, but he was so bright. He said, we laugh at the most inappropriate times. We laugh at funerals. You'll laugh at your own mother's funeral. He said, I would wager this, that a man, uh, many, men, or some, on death row, have, as they entered the execution chamber, giggled. And the minute he said it, I knew it was true. 
And now, whatever, you, yeah. you not only work in spite of the audience, in mm -hmm. fact, I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. All the laughter comes in right. and helps me now. Absolutely. There but is in the beginning, were you frightened? To very death. Th yes. To death. Really? When you, when you first yeah. came out with this big scene at the end of the go, yeah. and you didn't yes. know how the audience was going to react, yeah. you were well, terrified? You were well, at, at first, there was, a, we, we carried on a, an actual Goat. goat. Not, yeah. a real, not a real goat, but right, it was all right. fabricated um, from <clears throat> synthetic material, but it looked real. Um, but in order to get it real, because the white really didn't play under the lights as anything but synthetic material, they had to marble it a little bit, and as Liz McCann memorably said, it looked like you were carrying on a bison. And, <laughs> and I thought, all right, I am making a fool of myself for a couple of nights, but if I am, so is Edward, and I'm in good company, and I'll, I'll go to, uh, to Helen back as a fool with him. So, uh, but I bring on this huge bison in the first thing in the first invited dress. There was a volley of laughter, the likes of which, because we, we had just been doing it in the sacrosanct atmosphere of the rehearsal hall, yes. where everybody felt the play's depth, you know, mm -hmm. and there hadn't been a lot of laugh. But here was 400 strangers. Yeah. You were here with this big bison, they're going to laugh, <laughs> you know. And then we had a um, memorable line, you know, um, that, that Edward has since wisely cut, um, that she, I said, you were right about her eyes volley of laughter. She had such beautiful eyes. Volley of laughter. She had such eyes. They were on the, the floor <laughs> calling for right. oxygen. So the whole thing was calibrated with the taking out and the putting in right. of two or three mm. lines. Mm. Yeah. But such was the real confidence and rightness of the piece. Of, yeah. that it was yeah. just those minor calibrations yes. that brought it to a totally different place. Exactly. Mm. A week and a half later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing process yeah. to go through. It's interesting that Edward is so, the play is so ready to be rehearsed and acted yeah. that the changes are very small. Really, when he not? comes in with a script, it's almost it's there. And the map and is surely drawn. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think it is interesting for our audience listening to us uh, how silent Edward is at the rehearsal. Mm. It isn't that there's going to be long and uh, discussions about the play or your performance in the play or your relationship to the other actors. We just do the play mm. the way you would rehearse music. Play the notes. Yeah. And, out of, and he gives you a lot of freedom, even as a director. Mm -hmm. Do it. Do it. And I think that's also very brave. It isn't, it isn't um, intrusive so that you feel oh, I have to do what the playwright says. You do what the play says. Mm -hmm. You do what the, where the words exactly. take you. And I can see that in her work, mm -hmm. this actress, that she is, uh, I mean, y you are free to create what you want, to bring what you want, but the, the words are taking you there, right. Right. which is back to your original point <clears throat> that that is not the easiest thing to give out in the theater. What's changed in the theater from the days of the Greeks is the amazing things you can do technically, mm -hmm. what you owe the audience for the enormous price of the ticket, how it must look, mm -hmm. how all that. But we, as actresses, know that some of the greatest things that ever happen in the theater are in an empty rehearsal hall with chairs and tables. When the script's as good as an Edward Albee script. Well, yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Talking about his, the women and the kinds of women he writes, since you've both played a variety of, or several different kinds of characters in the play, is it fair to say that he seems to be interested in women who, in the case of the goat, when the world, their world is shattered, they go on and they just pick up the pieces and they try to reassemble it. That there's great strength in these women uh, and that the, the bravery in the lives of these women is that they go on in, the sp in spite of all the terrible things that often happen to them in his plays. Well, it's interesting. When you asked the question, I was thinking of those three speeches, those almost arias at the end of Three Tall Women, when the uh, middle-aged woman says the happiest time in your life is now. Right. while we're living it. And the young girl thinks of the past and, and hopes that we'll be happier in the future because she has a future ahead of her. Mm -hmm. And the final aria in the play, the older woman says, 
well, the happiest moment of all is when we stop. And in its way, that's as terrifying as the story of what happens with the goat. I mean, have we seen all these lives and then it's saying it's the end? It, I mean, that's the thing that you, you go away with. And I think Edward was really saying it's the living of the entire life mm -hmm. until that moment when it's over. It's, your, it's everything that happens mm. to a character, to a woman. And Martha and, and the character, um, Stevie, yeah. uh, they ha uh, it's such a popular word now, but I understand why people use it. They have a journey. They certainly change in front of us. And he has, Edward Albee, the ability to show you a lifetime in what is usually in his plays a very short time. Mm. He doesn't take you when you were young and when you were in, you know, have someone play you when you were young or go, it's linear and direct and he shows you a lifetime. He does with the men too, of course, but that's part of his greatness. Mm -hmm. Whether you understand what happens the events of the play, why he chose them, that is up to the audience. But they understand the character of the woman. Mm -hmm. They know this woman from but this what is they a, see. This is a strong woman. I mean, you have the great line where she says, you broke something and it can't oh be fixed. And yet you God. go about trying to keep this family together in spite of Until this Until she can't event. anymore. Until she cannot. Well, and of course, that's, your in, that, that's right. also your interpretation right, right, of, right. of what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> All, all of his women are so-called strong, I think we would I largely think so. say. Um, uh, uh, but they're all exceptionally vulnerable at the same time. I, I'm always fascinated. Um, you know, when I was 24, mm. I did mm. Agnes in some college performance of Delicate Balance, and that's when I first fell in love with that the language. beauty and the music of that language. They're strong women, but they also have this vulnerability. And I felt in every one, all three that I've played, mm -hmm. that Edward indwells in these women yes. very deeply, yes. you know, as well as his men. And uh, um, th they are full of inner conflict. They are f full of, of, the, of the agonies of the, you know, life wounds us. And he shows us these women getting wounded by mm -hmm. life. You know, and with this ragged, insistent life force coming back, mm -hmm. right? You know, now what? They're not toppled by life, these women. But is he, but is he, you? I thought of Agnes, uh, the character of Mercedes played when she was young, uh, that Jessica Tandy created so brilliantly, mm -hmm. and when that play had its first preview, uh, and Jessica had just finished the opening speech, she had to speak to Edward in the intermission because she felt she'd failed him because th of the laughter, because she didn't know that the audience would also see the humor of it. Mm -hmm. There's so much humor in all these women. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking when we said strong women and you said vulnerable women, then I thought of Honey in Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. right. Well, she's fighting for her life too, right. isn't she? Right. I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a portrait gallery, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes and think of what's to come, how amazing and touching that tribute he gave to Irene Worth in the piece he did, the appreciation of mm -hmm. her life and work, when he said he would probably write another part for her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, it's interesting, we all were, were talking about having read Mel Gussell's wonderful biography yes. of Albee, and it, it's interesting to me reading that how many of his characters were informed by the women from his childhood. Most particularly, his very complicated relationship with his dominating adopted mother, Absolutely. his alcoholic aunt, and he keeps the same. Do you find this? He keeps drawing on this well of of these few women that were he grew up with his grandmother. Yes, but if we didn't know that, yes. we wouldn't know that. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yes, and of course, to be to, to, for him to have written The Three Tall Women after his adopted mother's death. Yes, and it seems he couldn't have written it, he no, says, until no, she died. No, because among a thousand other things he is, he is a gentleman. He's a gentle man. And whatever terrors were in his heart about that woman, he waited, to, or had to wait, yes. to write that play. Yes. And it's not a cruel play. 
Mm -mm. Uh, it, and and I don't think he's. I don't think he has that slant about his characters. I think he probably loves them all when they are being terrible to each other. I think the playwright loves them. Absolutely. I mean, I thought of this so many times, having read Mel Gussow's uh, biography, that bo in both the women I've played in my really adult life, um, Martha and Stevie, and Stevie even carries the masculine nickname. Yes. Which is odd. My mother's nickname was Mickey. Huh. Um, <laughs> but, um, she, uh, there's all, all sorts of wonderful little um, synchronicities sometimes yes. when you work with. Yes. I, I have felt in both of those roles, it's, it just hit me again and again. My God, he loved his mother. Oh. He was enchanted by her in some way. He must have been. Yeah. You know, people he was say fascinated was a, by her. Yes, and other people were too. Mm, Apparently, yeah. Frankie, as they call right. Frankie, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> because I feel that he is, he loves and is enchanted by both these women that I've played, Martha and Stevie. Oh yeah. He put oh, so yes. much of himself. He he. There's something in that woman that yeah. was so rich. Absolutely. It, it just never stops yielding. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you look forward to every. Play again and again. What 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 will the next woman be? And of course, there's the Louise Nevelson character right. in The Occupant, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and w which is a, a extremely loving, and yet extremely critical view of a woman's life, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in her relationship to her child. And that's still ahead of us. I read this morning that that may be done again. Yeah, and, and Bancroft would have been ill. She'll come yes, back. Yes, that she okay. would do it again. Give us just a sense, though, what it's kind of like to hang out with Edward uh, at rehearsals. I mean, uh, do you know when he's, how does he ex express his happiness with your performance? Or if he has a little criticism about something you're doing, how does he tell well, you that? I'll speak first because I'm older. <laughs> 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 but when I was in a delicate balance, I could hardly speak to him. I brought that to him. He didn't. Mm -hmm. wasn't unapproachable. I just, I just was so amazed by him. And so when I did the other plays, the thing that always touches me is that he, he doesn't have to praise you. That's not the point. But for instance, in the final run through in the studio of uh, the play about the baby, and you want to say, to prove in a childish way to the director and the author that here is the performance. And so it's, it's just like an opening night, isn't it? <coughs> I mean, this, you've just got to yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. And I did it. And when it was over, there's a very um, embarrassingly narrow corridor leaving the rehearsal. And there was Edward, and you have to look. And I looked into his eyes and he said, Whatever. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I, I thought, oh God. And I'd left out the word whatever. Oh God. To be with him is a joy. <laughs> he, is a, he is an amazing friend to have mm. beyond all this of his great writing and his art. He's a great friend. Was there a moment he? in the goat when you, you know, were struggling with this character in the beginning of the audience where he had any private time with you where he would sort of guide you through it? Or how, how, how did he convey his happiness with your performance or any criticisms he had? Uh, I, too, uh, brought uh, such a reverence um, to Edward uh, that uh, I, I, I was at a I got tongue tied. When I, I still do. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, I, I first met him with Irene Worth mm -hmm. uh, several years ago at his Christmas party. We had both just come from another Christmas party where I had had quite a bit of champagne, <laughs> and I think I was trying to be very impressive and too young and too gay and fabulous, you know. And he just looked at me like I was a Martian. And as we went down the elevator back down to the street, I thought, Oh dear, that was not a good performance, Mercedes. And then the next time I met him was in one of the many incarnations of the play about the baby, one of the earlier ones that didn't. Uh, eventually happened, but I read for your role, and thank God I saw you do it because then I found out what it was real, how it was done. <laughs> but it was not a very good reading. I was very nervous, and I went out on the street, and I thought I will never work for this great uh. man. And I wept. Have you ever had an audition? Uh. You walk and you get out to the street, and you say the tears, so you hit the pavement. So I thought I would never work. So I was very surprised when he let 
allowed me to do, um, Martha. Mm -hmm. And he came out and uh, for the first preview, which was terrifying to me, I'd just barely gotten all the lines. It's like trying <coughs> to memorize War and Peace. Yeah. <laughs> and we had like three and a half weeks. So there he was in my dressing room afterwards, and he, he gave me one very specific note about anger and one very specific note about love, and yet very general too, very poetic, but very au point, just to the point. And um, he said, but you're on the right track. Ah. And um, the first run through of our play uh, in the rehearsal hall, he said to me, good, you're doing very good work. And my heart just yeah. flew away. You good know? work. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the highest praise from yeah. Edward Albee, good it work. It is, good work. <laughs> well, you're do we're both doing good work. You're doing terrific work in The Goat uh, on Broadway right now. And you've done wonderful work in all those Edward Albee plays. And we're come to, we'll come to see you at uh, The Public in Helen. Yes, by Ellen McLaughlin. Yes. Mercedes Rule and Marion Sellers, thank you very much thank for being you. our guest tonight on the Theatre Talk. Thank you. Thank you.